Our verse this evening will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1-5. through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lawfully speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear, and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Good evening, and good day to you one more time. Uh, again, I appreciate so much the invitation for our family to be with you all and your lovely hospitality and the kindness you have shown us. And for those of you who will have heard all three of these lessons today, I think it would be fair to say that all three of them will be very different approaches and different takeaways. And that's kind of my goal. And I also want you to know that um, toward the end of a lesson that uh, Troy and I were, were recording in the podcast yesterday, we both agreed that that was a really good lesson. And I just said, I read it in a book somewhere. Uh, and, and I think that would be fair to say to any of these things that I'm trying to communicate tonight. And uh, if you gain any nugget of wisdom, please know that it's not original with me. Tonight, as I try to provide for you some kind of practical guide for evangelism or mission work, or whatever it is that you're trying to do as you take the gospel and go and be some kind of evangelist for the Lord, all these little things that I pulled together into this presentation are things that I've just picked up along the way that have struck a chord with me. They meant something to me and they helped me in my personal evangelism. And it's a blessing for me to try to share them with you in a way that I think might be helpful. But if there's anything lacking in the presentation or delivery, it's with me and not the methods that I try to give you tonight. And it begins with asking us a question uh, or at least um, encouraging us to consider how we would fill in this blank. Wherever you serve in your life as a Christian here at Margaret Street or if you're a visitor somewhere else, how would you finish this sentence? Think about it in your own mind. I feel valuable to my congregation's evangelism efforts because I, because you what? What are you doing to feel like you are a valuable asset to the congregation's evangelism? You might need to take a step backward when you consider this fill in the blank and you might not even know what your congregation's evangelism efforts are. You might need to ask those questions first before you approach this one. But this morning we discussed how an evangelist could simply be understood or defined as somebody who takes good news and delivers it to another person. So we asked the question, are you an evangelist? Are you somebody who carries the news and delivers it to somebody else? And when we think about what we are or what we do, we are trained in our Western society to think about, well, what are the qualifications of somebody doing that? What's the qualification of being an evangelist? And as I go along the scriptures and I try to find those things which are related to evangelism, I find a few things. For instance, when we think about speaking truth, isn't that what evangelism requires or involves? I want to speak the truth, but Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, that, that we ought to speak the truth how? In love. And so a qualification for an evangelist would be that of love. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love yourself enough to put yourself out there in order to love your neighbor and so on? Another qualification might be that of motivation. In Romans chapter 1, Paul famously says in verse 16 that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's God's power for salvation. But leading up to that verse in verse 16, prior to that, he talks about how he himself, thinking about where he was and by the grace of God where he is now, he is indebted. He is indebted to take the gospel to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And so he was motivated to take the gospel. So qualifications being that of love and that of motivation. And then the third qualification would be related to what our brother read for us tonight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul spent 18 months with the people in Corinth, and he went away knowing that he had done his job. And reflecting on the time he spent with the people of Corinth, he boils it down to this. I determined to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. Now, if you fill in the blanks and you read between the lines and you understand the context, you know he preached to them more than simply Christ Jesus and him crucified over and over and over. But the idea is everything that he did preach went back to that basic fact. Christ Jesus was crucified for you, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And so that is a very basic knowledge of what the gospel is, Christ Jesus and him crucified. So we've got love, motivation, and 
basic knowledge. And so therefore, I come to the conclusion that every Christian should be qualified. Why? Well, I think it would be safe for me to assume you have all three of those things. You've got love, motivation, and basic knowledge. But how can I assume that of you? Well, if you're a Christian, those are the three things that took you to the point of obedience, isn't it? That you loved yourself, your soul, and your Lord enough to be motivated to follow through with that basic knowledge of what the gospel is and what it means to obey the gospel. And so if you're a Christian, you are qualified to be an evangelist, but... But what? Here's what I would offer sometimes. Yes, I know. I know that I've got the basic knowledge, and I love my neighbor enough, but I'm weak. I I don't have what it takes to be fill-in-the-blank, whoever you have in your mind as a successful and a good evangelist. But I I can't speak well. I've got the knowledge up here, but it, it rattles around, and when it comes out, it just doesn't come out very eloquent, and it's not very convincing. I, I literally shake when I try to approach somebody with the gospel. Let me tell you a quick story of my first attempt. When I was in the position where I knew that as a Christian, I should be sharing the gospel with other people, but I hadn't really done it yet, I would put myself in easy to get out of situations. I would ask the people I expected to say no. So I went to a family member who was very staunch and devout to her religion, and I would say, hey, would you like to study the Bible? No, no, no. And I would ask her over and over. And one day, <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> now what? And so we set a time for us to get together to study the Bible. I was so scared of what I was going to do in that moment. So I went home, and um, my band had recently played a show in Memphis. We handed out all kinds of flyers, but we had some leftover ones, and I had a stack of, of scrap paper that was useless now. It was outdated. And so I turned it over, and I used the backside of those those sheets of paper to write out a manuscript of everything I wanted to say at that Bible study. And I wrote in pencil because I knew I'd mess up and I want to erase and everything. So I took that stack to our Bible study and and I lifted it and I was shaking. Thank you very much for agreeing to study the Bible with me. Smile. Please turn your Bible to John chapter 3. And I was shaking that the paper started rattling. And she asked, are you okay? Hmm. I, I don't know. It's not. It's not. <laughs> I was so scared. But I've come a long way, thankfully, to, by the grace of God. And you know what? The gospel was powerful even that night. And it had nothing to do with me. And I think about how Paul introduces or reintroduces himself to the people of Corinth as we read tonight. That powerful verse of how I determined to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. But you get what else Paul said? He's the guy in my mind when I'm trying to measure up to a great evangelist. I think about Paul. Yet what does he admit about himself when he was in their midst? I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. He goes on to say, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Now, we are trained to think that the people who come with eloquence and wisdom and power, those are the successful people. But Paul said it was important that those things were not involved in my evangelism. Why? So that I could demonstrate the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I'm not trying to say you should degrade yourself and take your talents and rub them down. But don't ever think that the things that you lack are the things that should keep you from sharing the gospel with your neighbors. When I was in that state of mind, we're kind of feeling guilty for not sharing the gospel, knowing I should. What can I do about it? I was reading a book called Hearts on Fire by Don Humphrey. I would encourage you to read that book. It was published in the 1990s, maybe 1990 it was. So it's an older book, but it's still very encouraging. And uh, if you can get a copy, it's published by the Gospel Advocate, or it was read it, it will encourage you. But one of the very first things that Don said in this book struck me because it applied to me and I didn't like how it made me feel. He said that the average member of the church has heard 4,000 sermons, has sung 20,000 songs, and participated in 8,000 public prayers. Amen, amen, amen to those things. Now, I wasn't 20 years in the faith, but I did the math one day. He doesn't say it in the book, but who does this apply to directly? Those numbers would apply to somebody who's been in the faith for about 20 years. That is, if you go to the church building three times a week. And so 
20,000 songs, 4,000 sermons, 8,000 public prayers. And when those things are offered up in this building, how many of them relate to sharing the gospel with those you know? Even today, we sang multiple songs that mention, at least in passing, our responsibility to teach the gospel. These things are great and good, but what about that last number? And has converted zero sinners. And that struck me, because that number applied to me. I'm not here to say that it applies to you. You know if it does or not. But I didn't like how it was making me feel. But uh, we also know that that last number actually doesn't depend on us. Participating in songs, that depends on you. But I can share the gospel with 20,000 people and that number could still remain zero. So let's put the ball a little bit more in my court. I also at that point had attempted to convert zero sinners. I knew I should, but there were so many obstacles to my doing so. And a lot of it had to begin with, I just don't know where to start. I know I should, but I haven't been equipped. Now, I had the opportunity to spend time with an evangelist in the Caribbean, and he treated me as a guinea pig, and before I knew it, he was training me. So that was a wonderful opportunity, but I do hope some of the things that I could share with you tonight might help you along your way as well. So we go back to that question about what are you doing right now in order to participate and uh, develop or further your congregation's evangelism effort, and what could it look like if you put a little bit more effort into it. I don't know. But I think about the numbers in my mind. Uh, I looked it up, and you could probably educate me a little bit better on these numbers because the internet isn't always right, whether or not you knew that. But it said that uh, 10,000 people live in Milton, but you would probably include further communities and so on. But let's just work with that number because it's an easy number to work with. And this morning we had 248 people in the building. Let's go with 250. So we've got 250 people shining as a light for Jesus in a community of 10,000 people. And I know there are other congregations, but let's just pretend we're the only ones right now who are trying to reach 10,000 people. Now, one of the status quos of evangelism for the congregations is sometimes to depend only on the preacher. Depend on the preacher. That's why we pay him. It's because he's supposed to be the evangelist. We pay him so he can share the gospel with the community. So we've got one guy who, in essence, it's his job to reach 10,000 people. If he reaches one person this year, praise God. And he has already done that if we consider the efforts this afternoon, right? One person this year, praise God. And if that continued going for the next 15 years, our numbers would go from 250 to 265, praise God, for every one of those numbers. But that's still kind of a far cry from 10,000, right? But he's reaching one person every single year. Maybe he could reach more if his load was lightened a little bit. But you know, he's busy, and I'm picking on Troy a little bit. He's got his podcasts, he's got his music, he's got his preaching, he's got his Bible classes, and all the things that he's trying to be involved in, plus his trips as he preaches and and goes to other countries or other parts of the United States. He could reach more, but he's busy doing other good things. So we'll just settle with one person a year, and that's all we can do in this congregation, because that's all we can do. But what if you also reached one person this year, or at least brought somebody who is ready to learn the truth. You don't feel equipped to teach them, but you can at least set them up with someone who can. And so therefore, you and the evangelist reach a person every single year for the next 15 years. Now we've gone to 280, right? But what if every single one of us did that? Next year, the congregation would be 500. And then it wouldn't go from 500 to 750, it would go from 500 to 1,000. Why? Because if we understand every Christian's responsibility to take the gospel to another person, again, we know that not everybody's going to say yes to a Bible study and not everyone's going to say the yes to the gospel once it's presented to them, but the numbers can speak for themselves and how long would it take us to get to 10,000? Just a few years. But if we depend on one person, we'll never get there. And I've done this before with the idea of you're the only Christian in the entire world right now, and you're supposed to reach 8 billion people. But if every Christian reached one person every single year, how long would it take you to get to a billion or 8 billion? It would take 8 billion years if you're just reaching one person. But if every Christian got involved, that one would turn to two, turn to four, turn to eight, and it would take only 31 years to reach a billion if every Christian is working with the gospel. For now, though, when it comes time for you to be evangelistic, what do you do? I don't know, and I don't want to impose this on you, but I do know that the status quo for a long time for a lot of Christians has been, well, I'll invite them to church. 
that's fine, and I'm not going to say that that's wrong. I encourage you to keep doing that because I know good lessons are taught here, but generally speaking, that's about as much as we often do. If we could get them to the building, we would reach them. But 15, almost 20 years of evangelism now has taught me that this is not true. This breaks down on three fundamental levels, not to mention the experience of almost every Christian that uh, it's not working, but think about a hundred years ago, this was pretty effective because the only way to be educated or entertained was to go outside the home. People were kind of bored in the evenings. It was time to get ready for bed or go do something. And you could put a gospel meeting flyer in, in the court and people would see that and they'd be interested in going. You could have a 30-day gospel meeting and it'd be standing room only. People would hear the gospel and respond and become Christians. But today we're competing with things that people are excited to go home for. They've got video games and YouTube and Disney Plus and, and a lot of time with their friends and family and FaceTime and so on. So those are the things that we're competing with. This breaks down on three fundamental levels because we can't get them to the building anymore. And number two, even if we can, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to reach them. In fact, every person I've known who has visited a congregation in later on became a Christian, it's not because they were sitting in the pew. That might have been part of it, but there were also Bible studies going on outside of the assembly. And so we talk about how important that is. And the third way that this status quo breaks down is this is not the biblical model of evangelism. Again, it's good for you to invite your friends and your family to visit with you at worship, but that's not how evangelism worked in the New Testament. When we talk about the Great Commission, Matthew's account, Mark's account, both of them use the word go. And, and so we need to be involved in going and not telling people to come to us. We often, uh, we often also offer up the excuse of there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. And I'm aware, by the way, that uh, later on this year, you're going to have a good school of evangelism come and teach you. Is it October? That uh, Brother Rob Whitaker is going to come. And Jesus taught them, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. No, I say to you, lift up your eyes and see that the the fields are already white for harvest. You might say there are yet four months and then comes the VBS, then comes the gospel meeting, there are yet eight months and then comes Rob Whitaker, and that's when I'll be evangelistic. And I think at that point you will be a little bit more equipped once you go through that school of evangelism, but also be aware that Jesus is saying, lift up your eyes for right now. The fields in front of you are white for harvest. And so in my personal experience as an evangelist, every person who comes to Christ, somehow, some way, they are involved in personal Bible studies. And so I guess a meaningful question to ask moving forward then is how can I set a personal Bible study? I would say that the first step to that is to have a conversation. Or maybe the first step would be to put that video game down or YouTube or get out of your office, get out of your home, and then start having conversations. You've got to have a conversation. And I know that might be the most scary thing in your mind right now. How can I have a religious conversation with somebody? One of the ways to do that is to think about the goals that a Christian has in having a religious or a spiritual conversation with somebody. Have your goal in mind of, of transitioning from the weather or the Lakers or the Gators or whatever to Jesus, to the kingdom. Why am I trying to do that? When I begin a religious conversation with somebody, I have the goal in mind that I want to develop their interest in the gospel where it is lacking. I don't know where they are. They might be an atheist. They might be a staunch religious person. But wherever they are in their journey, I want to develop their interest in the gospel where it is lacking. And I want to carry on that conversation for the second goal. I want to increase their curiosity in questions that have real answers. And we'll kind of break that down in just a moment. But as I introduce the concept of questions, we need to know that questions are sometimes the evangelist's most neglected tool. Why? Because you and I, we spend most of our time in Bible study answering questions because we've got questions. We learn the answers and we are so excited to tell people the answers to the questions that we ourselves have. So once they ask us a question, we are just so excited to be able to provide them an answer. But think about what that does to your goal. If you've got the goal of trying to develop their interest in the gospel or increase their curiosity, and then you provide the answer, what does it do for those things? Completely destroys their curiosity. When you're curious about something, what do you do? When you're young, you go to your parents and you ask a question, right? When you're older, you go to Google, you ask the question. And today we've got these smartphones that have uh, the voice assist assistance, or we've got the new AI and chat GPT, and we can ask all kinds of questions. And we go to these things because we've got questions on our mind, like, What's the average lifespan of the North American black bear? And Siri's going to tell me. The 
The average lifespan in the wild is 18 years. There you go. All right. And then she says, here is a list of 10 different scholarly articles that have 20 pages each of references that come to the same conclusion that 18 years is, would you like to follow the links and read all of those resources? No, I have my answer, thank you very much. Go back in my pocket. I'm not interested in talking to you anymore. But what if you serve as Siri to your friend? The person says, do you really believe that baptism has anything to do with salvation? Yes, I absolutely believe that. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Mark 16, 16, they all say this, this, and this. Would you like to study the Bible about that? Why would I put forth the effort to study the Bible about something you just told me in three seconds? I don't have to put forth the effort. And, by the way, I'm conditioned in the postmodern world to filter everything through that slogan of, we're all entitled to our own interpretation. That's really just your opinion, and I can either accept it if I agree with it, or deny it as your opinion, because I don't agree with it. I've got preconceived ideas. So, here's the one thing that I would encourage you to start thinking about as you approach people with religious conversations. Stop telling and start asking. Consider the difference between, yes, I completely believe that. Here is the proof of why I believe that. Would you like to study the Bible about that? Or, well, that is a fantastic question. What are your current thoughts about baptism? And it gives them an opportunity to start talking to you about what they think, and then it would be reasonable, their curiosity about what you think has already arisen, and then you can say, well, what do you think Jesus says about that? And they might say, I don't know. Perfect time for you to say, would you like to know? Fantastic. Let's t get together this afternoon for coffee and we'll explore some of the things that Jesus had to say about baptism. When we approach conversations with questions in mind, let's remember that there are two different types of questions. You know this, that there are open questions and closed questions. And the open question is going to get you very far because closed questions can only be answered yes or no. And so uh, I could tell you a story about my friend who was training to go door knocking, and it was pounded in his head, look, we're going out today to find truth seekers. And so the first door that he knocked, he said, hey, are you looking for truth? And the guy said, nope. <laughs> okay, have a good day. And so imagine how far that conversation could have gone if he asked op an open question instead. Uh, so thinking back about Siri and how she said 18 years, all right, we know Siri and Google's job is to provide us concise information, go back into our pockets. But wouldn't it be interesting if she said, well, I'm supposed to tell you it's 18 years, but hold up. Wouldn't you be interested in finding out why in Wisconsin it's 38 years and in Michigan it's two years? I don't know if those are true, by the way, but yeah, and that's where we get our average from. But why are they so different? I don't know, Siri. Why don't you tell me? Well, let's have a Bible study about that later on this afternoon and see what Jesus has to say about that. So as an evangelist, let's remember the opportunity to stop telling people the answers to Bible questions and start asking because we want to develop their interests and increase curiosity because those are the things that we look for. We look for answers when we're curious. And if we can develop their curiosity in things, then they will pursue the answers. Here's another thing that you're definitely going to come across as someone who is starting to have conversations with people is they build themselves, and perhaps you do too, they build their entire worldviews on slogans. Why? Because it is uncomfortable in the American society right now to have religious conversations. Since the 1970s, it's been drilled into our heads that the two things you don't talk about, either with strangers or close family members, are politics and religion, right? And so people are trying to sidestep those uncomfortable questions or conversations, and so they'll offer up to you slogans. Don't hold that against them. They'll say things like, well, we're all on different roads that lead to the same destination, or one church is just as good as another. We all serve the same God, just in different ways. So long as you believe Jesus is Lord, I've got no problem with you, and so on. You, you can fill in the blank with stuff that you've heard or possibly even said yourself. What they're used to doing in that moment is for that to shut down the conversation and move on and let's keep talking about the weather, please. But for you, this is a perfect opportunity to carry that conversation on and fulfill your goal of developing interest and increasing curiosity with two questions that I'd like to equip you with. Number one is, well, what do you mean by that? And number two, how did you come to that conclusion? None of those is 
uh, harsh. None of those rubs the wrong way. But what it does is allows for relationships, an evangelistic relationship, to develop a little bit further. So somebody might say, well, don't you know that science has already proven that the existence of God is impossible? Well, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that with me. What do you mean by science? Give them an opportunity to define science for you. What do you mean by impossible? What do you mean by God? And what you might find, by the way, is who they're thinking about as God is a completely wrong image of who God is, and you can agree with them. I don't believe in that God as well. But a good follow-up question is, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Because a lot of people are not used to having their worldviews or their slogans questioned, and you could be the one to help them question it for themselves. So one of the things we want to come across is people not who question them, but we want to encourage them to question their own thoughts. And then also people who don't answer their questions, but at least provide them an opportunity to discover answers on on their own because that's what won me to the Lord. I was surrounded by a lot of religious people who seemed to have the answers, but then finally somebody started asking me questions and I didn't know. And I would say, so what does the Bible say? And he said, that's a good question. Let's find out through a Bible study. And he gave me an opportunity to discover the truth on my own. And so as we go about, let's remember not to provide answers for our questions. Uh, for their questions, and let's also be careful about mic drops and uh, answers that make people feel foolish and shameful. But so far, everything that we've talked about are things that go on during a conversation. But you might be wondering, well, how can I even begin that conversation? I'm going to blow your mind with how complex this is. You better be taking notes. Uh, but if you want to start a religious conversation, here it is. It's a 28-step process. You simply say, may I ask you a question? I mean, if somebody stopped you in your daily activities and said, may I ask you a question at any time? You've been talking about the weather, or you haven't been talking at all, and they just walk up to you and they say, may I ask you a question? How are you going to respond? You're probably going to say, sure. In the moment, you might think, should I be concerned? What are they going to ask? But at least whatever they're about to say is important to them to break through that barrier. We're not talking about stuff like the weather anymore. Whatever they're going to say is important to them, and I owe it to them my attention. May I ask you a question? And uh, most people are going to say yes, just like you would say yes. Now, the only reason why somebody would say no to that is either they're grumpy in the moment or they're too busy in the moment. And in that case, you don't want to be talking about important stuff anyway. So move on and come back at another time. But if they say yes, you know what they've done is they've given you permission to talk about anything at all. May I ask you a question? Sure. Why is the sky blue? Why didn't Peter Jackson include the scouring of the Shire and the return of the king? What are your thoughts about Jesus? And there you go. You're not trying to shove anything down their throat. They're being approached in a way that they've probably never been approached by a religious person before. In fact, they don't even know if you're religious. They just know that you're curious about whether or not they're religious. What are your thoughts about Jesus? Every time I ask this question, I am never uh, assaulted. I'm never just shut down. Someone might say, I'd rather not talk about it. But nobody's ever been rude. Somebody has said, I don't have time to talk about this right now. Thank you. But nobody has hit me or fizzled a relationship saying, you know, we've been friends for 15 years. I can't believe you said that. I'm out of here. But most of the time, people have been happy to answer that question. Thank you so much for sharing with me something that's obviously very important to you. Now, a moment ago, you said that Jesus is a good person, but you don't think he's the son of God. Well, what do you mean by a good person? And what are some of the things that you think Jesus did that were good? What do you think Jesus himself said about that? I don't know. Would you like to know? And at this point, I think it would be honest of them to say yes. If they say no, then why did they talk about it for so long? And so you, we, you and I have so many opportunities to actually equip ourselves for evangelism. And not every opportunity is equal for all of us because we all have different gifts. We all have different goals in mind. And so I'm not trying to replicate myself in you. You can be involved in evangelism in a way that's totally different than me and still be very successful. But there are also many schools of evangelism that I would encourage you to sign up for if you have the opportunity. 
and I had already prepared this slide before I knew Rob Whitaker was coming. So that last one stands for House to House, Heart to Heart School of Evangelism. That's what's coming your way in October. So I would encourage you to sign up for that whenever you get the opportunity to do so. And so I hope some of the things that I said to you meant something to you. If not, if, if it meant something to one person here, I believe my time was well used. Let me also do something that's very uncharacteristic of me. Uh, I'm going to read a poem. And this is the only poem I've, I think I've ever read in a lesson, because I'm not somebody who chases poems, but this one really struck a chord with me. And as I read it, by the way, I don't know anything about Lon Wood Woodrum except he authored this poem. So if you know anything about him that would uh, put me in a dark light, please don't hold that against me. Maybe he's great. I, I just don't know him except this poem. Uh, but as I read it, you might choose to close your eyes and picture the vivid image that he pa paints before you. Deep in the shadow of slumber one night I lay on my bed and dreamed I stood on a mountain with valleys before me spread. The valleys were wide and yellow with beautiful waving grain and a cloud hung back in the distance loaded with tempest and rain. Looking I saw in the valley laborers, but oh so few. I knew the gathering tempest would break before they were through. Although they were all so busy bending themselves to the work, they saw the storm was approaching and knew that they dared not shirk. Then near the foot of the mountain I happened to turn my eyes, and there stood a man whose visage was brighter than sunset skies. He spoke in such tones of sorrow it caused my heart to bleed. Behold, how white is the harvest with reapers so few indeed. Why are the workers not many? I thought to myself, and then I glanced about me and noticed the mountains were full of men, men who were laughing and joking, playing some sort of game, not seeing how ripe the harvest or heeding the storm that came. Soon I could stand it no longer. Listen, I shouted amain, the tempest shall soon be rushing over the beautiful grain. Why waste your time in frolic? Look at the gathering cloud. But one of them quickly answered, you're one of this idle crowd. And then came the crash of the tempest, the rushing wind and the rain came howling over the valleys, ruining the yellow grain. The heavens were rocked from thunder, the lightning split the skies, till we who stood on the mountain covered our poor blinded eyes. Above the crash of the tempest, the voice of the stranger broke, Behold, the ruin of the harvest, this is the heathen, he spoke. The storm that so widely rages is God's judgment day, and I woke, I wept, in repentance, as there on my bed I lay, calling on God in the heavens, with contrite spirit I prayed, O Lord, I will be a worker. Too long, too long have I played. Because of the ripened harvest, I give you my heart and my arm. I'll spend my strength in the valleys to save the grain from the storm. It's been my pleasure to be with you today, my families as well. And I bid you, God bless you, and, and go with him. I do know that there is an invitation song for us to sing and I hope somehow, uh, if you've come here tonight and you are in need of the prayers of the church or baptism or rejoicing or any need that we might be able to offer you, please let it be known while we stand and sing this song.